Amen. Good evening. Good evening here. Uh, go ahead as you come up on the screen. Go ahead and share that actual the actual stream as we get ready for teaching tonight for Bible study. Are we ready to go ahead and get into this word tonight? For God will give us a good word, a rhema word for what we're preparing our hearts to receive tonight. Amen. It is good to be here tonight as we get ready for folks to come up and to receive this mighty word that God has for us tonight. Amen. So we count it not robbery to be here tonight as we get ready for what God is going to pour into our hearts tonight. <clears throat> and as you come up, go ahead and just give me a shout out out there and let me know that you're here. Uh, we are ready to go ahead and cast off. Amen. Cast off and do what God has, thus says the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> good evening there, EI Ministries. Good to see you tonight. Uh, we have a word for you that God is ready to go ahead and uh, I would say and laminate our minds into an area of ministry that is missing in the church. Amen. I see you out there, Lisa. I see you, Miss Thompson. I uh, thank you guys for showing up. And if you will share the actual link, I see Miss Westbrook out there. Share the link because we're going to talk about something that is so unique in the body of Christ that is missing. <clears throat> that is missing. And we all need to be able to get this tonight. I'm going to be talking about something that's going to help us tonight to grow. So join me in a word of prayer as we get ready to break the bread of life as we get prepared for this teaching. Oh, great and mighty God, we thank you, God, for this actual platform. We thank you, God, for this ministry called EEI Ministry, God. And as we go forth right now, God, allow your spirit to fill me right now, to dwell, God, to be able to empower me, to be able to impact your people with this mighty word tonight, God. God, we pray right now that in the end that they get knowledge and understanding, your word be illumination, your Lord word be an inspiration, your word be a confirmation, God, that we be able to move forward on one accord, God. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. I see you out there. My wife out there. Uh, first lady, I see you out there, Brother Sale. <clears throat> Tonight, we're going to be talking about something very interesting that I believe that we need to touch basis as we move as an actual ministry <clears throat> in the area that we're heading in this season that God has us. And one thing we need to talk about is the elements of unity. <laughs> unity. We as an actual church body have to learn how to be unified. And many people, we don't try to talk about being unit, having unity. We all talk about all the stuff that's creating us from being able to be unified. <clears throat> and so I want to talk about the things that are going to help us to grow in unity as we build a ministry that's going to help enhance the kingdom of God. Amen. That it should represent these elements. And so the actual key scripture tonight will be coming out of Ephesians. If you have your Bible, you want to follow along. Ephesians 4, 4 through the 7th verse. Ephesians, the 4th chapter, 4 to the 7th verse. If you have your Bible tonight and you can follow along because it's going to be very interesting and take notes tonight because we're going to be talking about unity tonight. <clears throat> if you have a chance, go ahead and share the link so we can get people in and share it to someone that you know. So, uh, in Ephesians 4, 4 through the 7th verse, the scripture reads this way. It says that there is one body, there is one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all and who is over all and through all and in all lord have mercy but grace was given to each of us according to the measure of christ's gift now <clears throat> when paul is talking he's talking about the church and how the elements these elements there are seven elements that he identified in these set of scriptures that that he gave us seven elements and i want to break down each element <clears throat> the first element paul is talking about in unity as a church 
is that he says one body. So what is he saying about one body? Meaning there's not two bodies. There's not several bodies of believers. There's only one body of believers. Now we know that we live in an in, imperfect world, but there are many denominations, but there's only one body of Christ. Catch that. There are many denominations, but there's only one body of Christ. Meaning God is creating only one body of people who trust him and follow his son, Jesus. That's it. One body. I don't care whether you're Pentecostal. I don't care if you're seven, uh, 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 Adventist. I don't care what you are. There's only one body of Christ. One, your denomination has nothing to do with your faith, your belief in Jesus. So when a person puts their trust in Jesus, there are six things that happen. There's six things that happen. Watch this. First thing, when you're talking about unity, <clears throat> first thing when you're talking about unity is this, that God gives a new birth to the believer who uh, quickens and, and have faith and belief in his son, Jesus. So when you become a believer in Christ, you have a new birth in Christ, meaning you're no longer of the flesh. Now you're born into the spirit based off of faith in Jesus. The second thing is that when that happens, when you are a, you have a new birth, now you become a new creature. See, and so now you're born in the spirit because you were born of the flesh previously. But now, because you have faith in Jesus, now you're born in the what? In the spirit, which means you are a beginning of being a new creature, spiritually. The third thing happens is that God then places his divine nature, his divine nature into the believer. Watch this. Go to 2 Peter 1 and 4. 2 Peter 1 and 4 says, through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Meaning God places his divine nature in us when we become a believer in him because what we are to be like him. Meaning divine nature is to be in the image of Christ. Divine nature is to be in the image of God. So his divine nature is of us when we become a new creature, when we believe in him. Now his nature is within us. He's shaping us to be like him. Number four, then what happens then is God places his Holy Spirit into the believer. And so the, the actual, when you become a believer in Christ, then you allow the Holy Spirit to be able to come into you and dwell in you. And the believer becomes a temple and a presence for the God, for the Spirit of God. So watch this. First Corinthians say this. First Corinthians 3 and 16 puts it this way. It says that do, don't you know that you yourself is a God's temple, that God's Spirit lives in you? So when you become a believer, then the Spirit of God lives in you. And then the Spirit of God then begins a work in you. And it starts working in you and through you. Oh, Lord, this is good here. And so that's what happens. And so though you are a babe and you just become a new believer, you're a new creature, there's a process that the Holy Spirit comes in you and start working through you so that you can get to the place of maturity. You won't get to the place of maturity on your own. You have to allow yourself to yield to the Holy Spirit, surrender to the Holy Spirit, and not grieve the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit can work through you to get all that stuff out of you. <laughs> I'm trying to help you tonight. And so not only that, number five is that not only that, then God causes the believer to do what? Then we begin to do what? We bear fruits. We bear fruits from the Holy Spirit being in us. 
That's why Galatians 5 and 22 puts it this way, that, that the fruit of the spirit, singular, the fruit of the spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and control, self-control. And so what happens now is that the spirit of God is in you and is working these things through you. And you can know a saint by the fruit that they bear. Okay. And then what happens then? God places us as believers into a new body of people. And then he's creating this into the body of Christ, which is his church. So that happens, number one. The first thing is that when we're talking about is, is the first element is uh, one body. The scripture says one body. So that's how we become one body. Through that process of us being new birth, new creature, divine nature, having the Holy Spirit come in us. And then God allows us to bear fruit. And then God places us in a new body, in a new place among like believers. The second thing is once we become one body, then there is only one spirit. Oh, one body, one spirit. The same spirit that dwells within one believer is the same spirit that dwells in another believer. Meaning nobody has more Holy Ghost than you. <laughs> we all have the same spirit because we believe in the same God. Now, 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 this is the key. That one spirit might work faster in someone else than it will work in you. And it's not because that person has a greater measure of the spirit. It's because that person is willing to yield to the spirit. When you yield to the Holy Spirit, then some of us grow not at 30, not at 60, but a hundredfold because we allow the spirit of God to percolate in our hearts and we give our heart to God. And then God allows his spirit to start working in us and through us. And so what happens is when the Holy Spirit dwells in us, it allows us to grow from being babes to being mature Christians. That's what happens. So there's only one spirit, and that is the Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit. He is a person. He, so it's not a thing. He is a person, the Holy Spirit. And he dwells in the members. And so John says this. John says this uh, in the Bible. He says that it is God's spirit that causes a man to be born again. And Jesus answered very quickly and said, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And so that which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit, capital S, is spirit. The spirit, the Holy Spirit, God's spirit, which is working in each and every one of us right now. And so the one spirit is reference to the Holy Spirit who indwells us in each and every one of us because we believe in his son, Jesus. Good God of mine. So we're one body that lives and operates off of one spirit, one spirit. So how do you know, how do you know, the question is, how do you know that, that the Holy Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit is the one that is operating in the church? Well, this is the answer. The Holy Spirit brings unity among believers and not division among believers. See, there can be some spirits in God's house, but it's not a Holy Spirit. Come on. And you have to understand that the fruit of the spirit, when we go back, it talks about the fruit of the spirit, right? So what are the attributes of the Holy Spirit? Here it is. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, goodness, gentleness, faith, meekness, and what? Control. That is the actual 
attributes of the Holy Spirit operating, the fruit singular of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And so when you have anything opposite of that operating in the church, it is not of God. It is a spirit, but it isn't a Holy Spirit. You get what I'm saying here tonight? And so you know it because the Bible says you know them by the fruit that they bear. What is the fruit that lies with the Holy Spirit? I don't see no love. I don't see no joy. I don't see no peace. Come on. I don't see no patience. I don't see no goodness. I don't see no gentleness in the way you talk. I don't see no faith in the things you're going through. I don't see no meekness, no humility. I don't see you in control. I see you out of control. And so when we're talking about unity and the body, we have to look at the elements, meaning one body. And we got to also look at the fact that we're saying one body, right? And so we got one body, then we got one spirit, one spirit, one spirit, one spirit. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And he is operating and he's doing that. So this is why it is so important that we learn to yield to the spirit. We yield to the Holy Spirit to control over us. And I'll get to that later. So we got what? One body. We got one spirit. And we got what? One hope. What is this hope we're talking about? There's only one hope. What is your hope? Not the hope to get a nice car. Not the hope of, of getting a nice home. Not the hope of, 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 of sitting there and, 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 and um, passing a test or something. Those are materialistic things. What this scripture is saying the hope is, is for every believer to have the same hope of the great day of redemption. Meaning the hope that, that, that we're talking about here is that we're talking about living in a new world that is created by God for us, which is known as heaven. The hope of making it in to the kingdom of God. See, this is just a place where we're preparing to live where God is calling us to. God Almighty. Meaning we have to get right here so we'll be ready when we get there. That is the hope. The hope. The life that we're going to live in heaven. And it is on earth as it will be in heaven. That is the hope that this text is talking about. So when you're talking about hope, we're talking about living a life that we should be living here on earth the same way we will be living in heaven. So when people come into the house of God, they expect to have a heavenly presence in the house of God, just like on earth as it will be in heaven. Just like we will praise God on earth as we will praise him in heaven. Not the way the world do it, but the way God wants us to do it. That is the hope. That is the way we are supposed to live as Christians. The hope. What is the hope? We should be coming in here unified as one body with one spirit with the hope of living the way we should be living as we are living in heaven as it will be on earth as it is in heaven. That is the hope. So there should be a life of oneness and unity and brotherhood and, and living a life that where we're not tearing down one another and saying things about one another, but we're coming together as one another in unity to make it seem when someone comes into God house, they should have the expectation of knowing that, hey, this is something different about this place. This is God's house here and they should feel the anointing. They should feel the spirit of God pertinating in the house because they feel it from the people of God because we're unified because we're all on one accord that's what it's about so what God is after for us is to live as we should live in the future we are to live like we are to live in the future the future is eternity that is the hope that he's talking about here Romans 15 and 4 if you got your Bibles, mark this scripture down. Romans 15 and 4 says, Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us the scripture that gives us patient encouragement so that we can have hope. 
So we read the word of God because the word of God is a word that's going to give us encouragement. We read the word of God because the word of God should give us the, the, the actual scriptures to help us in our patience for the hope that when God takes us from here and he let, when he lifts us up into the kingdom, then we are to know how to live as kingdom people. That's what we're doing. We're kingdom people building the actual, the way heaven is on earth. That's what we should be giving people. The way God loves us unconditionally is the way we should love other people unconditionally. That's the hope. So we should be identifying ourselves, doing the things that the way God wants us to do. So here it is. So you got one body, one spirit, one hope. And then here it is. We got one Lord, one Lord. We should be united as believers because we have come to the same Lord, one Lord. There's only one Lord, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other, one Lord, and he is the Lord over the universe. He is the Lord that created the earth and the heavens. He is the one that created everything and he keeps everything intact. He's the one that makes everything function and operate. He's the one that wakes you up in the morning. He's the one that covers you when you're sleeping at night. He's the one that heals you when your body is broken. He's the one that hears your prayer. He's the one that's making intercession over you daily to the Father. That is the Lord, one Lord, who is the image of the invisible God that we serve. The firstborn of every creature, a firstborn of every creator, every creation. He is the Lord. For by him were all things created. That means things that are in heaven and the things that are on earth and the invisible things and the invisible things. The things that are visible and invisible. Whether they are be in the thrones or the dominions or the principalities or the powers. All things were created by him, the Lord. And, and for him, for him, and he is before all things and by him all things. What coexists? The Lord. That is the key. And if there to be unity among Christians, then Christ must be the Lord over our lives. You can't sit there and have everything else over your life and then talk about the Lord is over your life. <laughs> he must be first. So as, as long as we as believers don't rebel against God's word and we are not disobedient to God's word and we're not living as carnal in God's word, living corrupt in God's word and as chaos and as, as believers, then guess what? Because when we are saved, when people are saved, then their hearts are warm and tender toward Jesus and his people and they acknowledge him as the Lord over their life and people know that by the fruit that you bear Jesus says you will know my disciples how do I know your disciples Jesus by the fruit that they bear what kind of fruit that they bear love, joy, patience goodness, meekness come on and, and, and so I know them by the fruit that they bear but when you got people always mad you got people always creating division. You got people who are always about themselves. It says, how can two go together except they agree? So you have to be in unity in Christ. You have to be on one accord in Christ. That's why the Holy Spirit came. He says that they were in the upper room and they all were what? On one accord. And when we are on one accord, the presence of God will be revelant in his house. You will have the present, you will have the actual Shekinah glory of God in the house and the spirit will be so high that people will get healed. People will fall over and people just want to worship God. You'll be crying and you don't even know why you're crying. You'll be shouting. You don't even know why you're shouting. And you'll be having joy in your heart. You don't even know why you got joy in your heart. Because of God, because of him being the Lord and you'll know how to worship him. Amen. And so, so not only do we have the one body, one spirit, uh, uh, one, one Lord, 
as we keep moving on through the scripture here, um, then we have uh, one faith. But before I get to one faith, watch this, watch this here. Let's look at this word Lord. The word Lord is used a couple of times in Mark and Matthews, but about 17 times in Luke, and then about 200 times in the form of another epistle, in the, in the other epistles. The Greek word for Lord is kudos, kudos, which is in a rich meaning in which it's add insight to the reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Basically, it is a word of authority. When you're saying Lord, that means you're saying he has authority. Meaning it is a word that he has domestic authority, such as a father who has authority over the master of his house. It is a word that for the master is in contrast to a master being in control and, and over the slave. It is a word that, that, that it has the undisputed ownership of any property. It is a word that means that the person who has authority to administer the death sentence upon any criminals. It is a word for moral authority, describing a man who had authority over himself, had self-control over the persons and the self and the strength of character. You ain't hear what I'm saying? So, so, so the Lord, the Lord. So watch this, watch this. It was the word for government authority. The word for government authority. You get what I'm saying? The Lord. So it's also a word of courtesy and respect. It is used to address superiors or elders such as a, a child to a parent or a student to a teacher, a servant to a master, a subject to a king, meaning the Lord Jesus is our superior. Oh, have mercy. The Lord Jesus is your superior. And if we had his attitude in our hearts, and if we had his affection, what he calls us to do, then we could change things in the world. We can change the way things operate and the way things are, are, are done in the world, in the kingdom. Because he is what? Our Lord. So watch this here. So not only, not only, let me get back up here because I want to make sure you get all of these. You go back to your scripture. So we have, uh, here it is. We got uh, one body, right? We covered that. We got one spirit, okay? We have what? One hope. All right, then we got one Lord. So what is next? What is next here? Uh, we have uh, number five, which is one faith. One faith. What do we mean by one faith? Believers as Christians, we ought to be united because we have one faith. One faith in who? In Jesus. So what is our faith is the question. Our faith speaks of God's revelation and the truth that has been given to us in his word. Come on. You can't sit here and say you got faith in him when you don't have faith in his word also. Oh, Lord have mercy. So when you have faith in him, that means you have to have faith in his word. And meaning whatever he say in his word, you have to believe that it is so. <laughs> when you say you are a believer, you have to have faith in his word as well as you have faith in him. Many people have faith in him, but that is a knowledge-based faith. But you don't have no faith in what he says in his word, which is the faith that you really should have. Because you should believe that your Lord is superior and has the authority to be able to be the creator. And he is the beginning and the end of everything. And watch this, there's nothing too big that he can't do. So when you say that he's your Lord, that means he's the Lord over your problems. Come on. When you say he's your Lord, that means he's superior over anything that you could be dealing with. Meaning that he has the authority and the ability to be able to change anything that you're going through. Meaning that sickness don't have power over you because you are the Lord's child. Nothing can take over you because he is the Lord. You ain't got what I'm saying here. And he says that, is there anything too hard for me? That's what his word says. So I have to have faith not only in him, 
but I have a faith also in his word and based off what he says. And so that's when you talk about him being one faith, you got to believe what you believe in him. You got to believe in what he says too. And so the faith speaks of God's revelation and truth as well as you believing in him and believing that he got up. Come on, somebody. And so the revelation uh, has come from the apostles. It comes from the, the prophets. It comes from our teaching and, and creation. It comes from the Holy Spirit talking to us. It comes from the death. It comes from the burial. It comes from the resurrection of Christ. It comes from the, the virgin birth. It talk, comes from the deity. It comes from the sinlessness. It comes from the second coming. It comes from salvation by grace through faith in Christ. The blood atonement for our sins. Come on. When we talk about faith, it talks about the sinfulness. When we talk about faith, it talks about the principles of God living in the actual his word and being a living epistle, a walking epistle. In all groups under the umbrella. That is the faith. Everything inclusive. That is what the faith is. And so when we depart from the teaching of his word, of the actual Bible in itself, then the result is what? Not unity, but disunity. Because we don't believe what his word says. We'll sit there and say, I believe in God. But soon as a trial comes, we don't believe in the word and the power of God that he can cover us because he's Lord and he has the authority. And he has the dominion and he has the power to reign and rule over everything. That's what you have to understand. You have to have faith. Not just in who he is. But faith also in his word and based off of what he says. That's what you got to believe. And so this is why it's so important to study the scriptures for yourself. The Bible says to, to study and show thyself approved unto God. A workman be not ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Paul says that you are to be a noble breeman, meaning that when someone teaches you something, you go back and you search the scriptures for yourself. Because then you understand the authenticity of God's word and knows that there is power in his word. There is power in the word of God. And that when you speak the word, Isaiah 55 and 11 says, when you speak the word of God, it will go out and it will do exactly what it's intended to do. And it will not return void. Meaning that when you know the word, you got power based off of the words. That's why they say death and life is in the tongue. So we speak negative things in our actual. We don't speak faith in our situation. We speak death in our situation. And when God says that, when you know my word, you speak life in your situation. And that's what will change your life. So not only have faith in me, but have faith in what I says as the almighty God, the Lord and Savior of your life. Because watch this. A lot of problems that we have could be avoided if we would do what the Bible says. <laughs> a lot of things that we're dealing with can be avoided if we do exactly what the word of God tells us to do. But we start taking this stuff, what other people are telling us, and we don't read it for ourselves. My job is God says, I'm calling you and giving you pastors after my own heart that will give you knowledge and understanding meaning it is my responsibility to teach you but it's your responsibility to go back and study it and read it for yourself so that you know what to do so when you can't get in touch with your pastor when you can't get in touch with your ministry you can't get in touch with a friend you have enough word in you to be able to cover you too to get you out of that situation and so here it is not only do we have that one faith, now here it is, we got one baptism. One baptism. Watch this, 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. I want you to go to that if you got a scripture, got your Bible. 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews, whether we be Gentiles, whether we be born or whether we be free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Watch this. This baptism of the spirit does not take place after conversion. 
Catch me, I'm about to go somewhere. It is not something extra offering by the Spirit of God, meaning the Holy Spirit totally comes into our life as Christians. Watch this, when we are saved. The Holy Spirit comes into our life when we're saved. This is why we are not commanded to be baptized in the Spirit because we get the Spirit when we have faith in Jesus. Come on. Meaning the power and the filling of the Holy Spirit comes as the Christian, watch this, surrenders themselves, yield themselves, and obey the Lord as they die to themselves. You have to die to yourself for the spirit of God to do the work in you. You have to surrender to the old you and allow the spirit of God to have total dominance in your life. You have to yield to what God has for your life so that you can see what he's trying to manifest in your life. This is why we are commanded to be filled because we are the ones that need to yield control of our lives to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, if you grieve the Holy Spirit, if you, if you, if you sit there and grieve the Holy Spirit, that means that you're fighting against the Holy Spirit to do the work that God is trying to do in you, through you, by allowing His Spirit to work through you. So the problem is not that we fail and, 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 and to have enough of the Holy Spirit because we all get Him. When he indwells in us, guess what? We all are saved. We don't get 50%. We don't get 75% of the Holy Spirit. We get 100% of the Holy Spirit. But watch this. The problem is that with many Christians is that the Holy Spirit doesn't have control of all the areas of their life. <laughs> Meaning you sitting there talking about, I got the Holy Spirit. But how has this person got the Holy Spirit and you got the Holy Spirit? Well, it isn't that that person got more of God's Spirit. It's that that person has yielded to God's Spirit. And you see the evidence of the Spirit of God working in that person's life. Doesn't mean that person ain't saved. It just means that that person ain't yielding and surrendering to God's. Come on. And so the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He's a gentleman. He is not going to fight against you. Come on. You have to submit to him so that he can work through you to make you the creature that you say that you want to be in Christ Jesus. And so when we grieve the spirit, when we quench the spirit, then we are only rebelling against the spirit and we're fighting against him. And that's why you don't see the results that you think you should be seeing. You see it in other people's lives, but you don't see it in your life because you live in a carnal lifestyle. You live in a fleshy lifestyle and you're being led by what is Lord over your life because God is not Lord over your life because you're not being obedient to his word. And so a spirit filled person is when we have yield control of all areas of our life and has obeyed God guidance, leading and command, leading us and commanding us in his word. That's what it is. And so when you're looking at that, that last one, meaning one baptism, that's what we're talking about. The baptism of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit. Because watch this, it's not about you getting into that pool back here. Because you can get in the water dirty and you can get out the water dirty. It is baptism is an outward sign of an inward change in your heart. I mean, if your heart ain't right, come on, then getting in that water ain't going to do no good for you. Your heart has to be right. Folks say, I want to get baptized. My first question is, why do you want to get baptized? Not because what the Bible says, I know that, but why are you wanting to get baptized now? Is there a change in your life? Have you been changed? How you treat people, how you've been changed? Do you feel the working and dwelling of the Holy Spirit in your life that you know now you're in the place where you need to be? That's what it's about. It is not for folks just seeing you get in that water and then you're getting wet and you're coming out. That is something real and genuine to God. It's just like making a mockery out of communion. When you're taking of it and the Bible says, let a man and a woman examine themselves. You just can't be going through the motion because God is God and he's real. 
And God sees everything. He doesn't miss nothing. He sees what is seen and unseen. And how he sees it, he sees it in your heart. You can hide it from us, but you can't hide it from him. Amen. And so we have to understand that the power and the feeling of the Holy Spirit comes as the Christian surrenders, as the Christian yields and obeys the Lord as he dies to themselves. As you die to yourself, then the Holy Spirit comes and the Holy Spirit is there and he's sitting there and he's ready to do a work and he's taking out that old you. And he's moving things out of you. And he's getting you right. He's getting you prepared for what the greater works that God has for you. And that's what he's doing. So watch this here. And lastly, there's one God and one father and father. There's one God and one father. That's the last element. And, and Mark 12 and 29 and 31 reads this wise. If you have Mark 12 29 and 31, write it down. Jesus answered, the most important commandment is this. Listen, people of Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Watch this. And the second command is this. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. For there is no other commands more important than these. Meaning we as Christians are to be united because we have the same God and the same father. Paul puts it this way. He says that there's one God and father of all and who is above all and through all and in all. Let me say that again. Paul says there's one God. And, and, and one father of all who is above all things that goes through all things. And guess what? He's in all things. Y'all ain't hear me. Meaning the term all is very significant here. Meaning it is a reference to all Christians and not the entire human race. Meaning that God is the, he's over all things. But in order for you to be his child, you got to believe in his son, Jesus. Come on. And that's the key. Because he says that when he comes back, he's going to deal with the household of faith first. That's the God that I serve, the Lord of my life. And our Lord is over everything. He's the ruler of the universe and he's above everything, including Satan. Satan don't have no power. That's why I don't give him no credit in my life. Folks always talking about the devil at you. The devil ain't got no power to do nothing when you got the Lord over your life who has power over everything. You putting Satan in a place that he doesn't have no authority. He's only in a place where God permits him to reign. But God rules and reign over everything. And you have that same power in you through the Holy Spirit. And when you become, and the reason why we should be able to live together and serve in unity is because we have the spirit of God that is dwelling in us. And so God told me to tell you tonight that we have to get to a place <clears throat> where we have to come together. And the last thing that he gave us was, here it is, number seven, I'm sorry, one ahead, number seven is the proportion of God's grace. Watch this in verse seven. Paul says that, but until every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ, meaning as believers, here it is, God has given us the ability to be united because of his gift of grace. He's given us the what? The ability to be united by his gift of grace. What am I saying? Grace enables all of us as Christians to be able to get along with one another. That's why he gives us the gift of grace. So that we can get along with one another. Grace makes us loving people. Grace makes us patient people. Grace makes us forgiving people. Because God is loving, he is patient, and he is forgiving. That's why we should be able to get along with one another. Because of his grace. Because of his mercy. Because of his goodness. Because of who he is. And so what he does is that he gives us that so that he can balance our Christian lives. 
and help us to be able to be united while serving him. That's why he gives us that portion of grace so that we can forgive people when we go through stuff, that we can go ahead and love people and not like their actual behavior, but to love them unconditionally when we don't like something about them. For us to be patient for them to get to where they need to be as a child of God, as a man and woman of God, because it is a process not to get frustrated over things all the time, but be patient over things and ask God, God, I need your grace. This thing is upsetting me. God, I need your grace. God, I need your grace because I need to love something. And why God and you going through these things is that God is right now. He's working in you and through you. And why things may be challenging to you, God is showing you his love, showing you his patience, showing you his forgiveness based off of how he sees things and how he do things with us every day. God is patient with us. God is loving with us. And God is what? He's forgiving to us because we do stuff wrong every day. And so if we are his children, we have his, his actual divine nature in us and his spirit in us for us to be able to do the exact same thing that he does for us. So God bless you tonight, EI man. I pray that this teaching bless you. The seven elements of unity, Ephesians 4, and I think it's Ephesians 4 chapter, and you're coming from the actual fourth to the seventh verse, I believe. And you take that tonight, you go back and read it for yourself. That's right, Ephesians 4 and the fourth to the seventh verse. Take this actual um, study tonight, go back, rewind it, get the scriptures that I give to you, study on the scriptures, meditate on the scriptures. That's enough food in here to hold you for a while until we meet on Sunday, man. Man, God bless you, man. I love you, man. And, and me and First Lady, we love you, man. And y'all keep up the faith, man. We have to be unified. We can't allow nothing to throw us off in this season, man. God has been too good to us in this ministry and how he has blessed us. And we have to continue to keep our eyes and our focus on the prize and doing his work. <clears throat> so we can't allow these small little things, little inner windows to get in the way. But we have to have patience, the proportion of grace, patience to be able to do what God wants us to do and to love folks the way they need to be loved, man. So God bless you, man. I love you out there, man. Share this word, man. And know that I'm looking forward to seeing you on the Sunday. God has a rainbow word for you. I look forward to seeing you, man. And, and if, you, if someone didn't get this word tonight, go ahead and share it to them, man, and allow them to get it. Man, God bless you, man. I love you, man. And I look forward, me and First Lady, look forward to seeing you guys on Sunday. So share this word. And if you want to sow a seed, Go to our website, www.deimin.2020.com, and you can go ahead and you can get our information, the source seed, via Cash App, via Zelle, via PayPal, via Tiley. Drop a seed in there, man, to bless the ministry, man, as we continue to go forth and do God's work and preach and teach his gospel, man. God bless you, man. I love you, man, and I'm signing out, man, and share this word. <laughs>